Okay, so uh, yeah, as Sasha mentioned, I have a scary number of slides. So I will be really flying through them because I kind of want to talk about multiple things that go actually beyond the title of this talk, as usual. So just to introduce myself, I'm Irina Rish. I'm a professor at the University of Montreal and uh, Mila, Quebec AI Institute. Uh, many of you might know, uh, Joshua Benjo's lab. Um, and I lead the Canada Excellence Research Chair, like seven year project with a large funding, which may be a little bit too large. So you get like 45 people in the group and it's kind of overwhelming. But anyway, so high level goal, uh, at least uh, for Canadian government is, or was four years ago that, okay, we'll push AI towards more autonomous and more general, just like everybody else would like to do. And uh, when we talk about general and we use open AI definition, we don't mean anything conscious or something. We just mean highly multitask AI where the tasks are useful. Uh, what we do, we do research on extension of neural scaling laws, trying to come up with more generic and universal functional forms like broken power laws, multivariate power laws, uh, stay tuned, coming soon. Um, this type of things are actually trying to cover wide range of uh, uh, modalities, uh, model architectures, settings, and so on, trying to go way beyond the standard power laws because sometimes uh, dependencies are highly nonlinear, there are emergences and so em emergence behaviors and so on. So that's one type of thing. The other type of thing is actually building models and yes, to address this problem with academia not having enough compute, uh, we had to form collaborations. On the next page, I'll uh, show you all the collaborators and try to apply for large compute uh, in different places. So for example, Oak Ridge Lab, uh, one of three uh, key uh, Department of Energy labs, uh, Summit and Frontier supercomputers, and those were very useful and instrumental in doing whatever projects I will be talking about. And uh, we applied there, Originally in 2022, uh, it was a large collaboration. Well, uh, in that year we applied jointly with Luther and with Lion, but uh, when the project was going on, uh, many other organizations joined and for example, Together and Stanford Center for Foundation Models and ETH Zurich and so on and so forth. So we actually running multiple projects. Some of them are already um, kind of releasing papers, releasing uh, models. We had like four language models of size 10 billion released in December. One uh, first Hindi model released in October, also same size. We released a suite of 20 uh, vision language models called Robin. I'll briefly talk about that later. And also time series uh, foundation models, although at relatively small scale. Anyway, there are many kind of ongoing things here as well. And it's only a part of our team. It's made like project leads. Uh, so who actually do all the work. And I'm mainly just putting slides together. So uh, one of the things last year that we did was uh, Red Pajama Inside joint work with a company together and Stanford Center for Foundation Models and other collaborators based on Red Pajama data set, uh, essentially training on Summit, 7 billion, 3 billion models. And uh, for some time, the Instruction 7 billion model was on the top of the um, uh, hugging face. But you know, you don't stay there for long. Uh, anyway, so it was a nice collaboration, but then we uh, decided that maybe we should try to train models continually, and that was supposed to be the main topic of this talk, and I'll get to that in uh, maybe one minute. Uh, you can find um, all the information on my website. Um, there are also blog posts and everything there. It's irina-lab.ai, and also all the links are in the slides. I'll share the slides. You can just click on this stuff. So as I mentioned, there is a Robin suite of models where one thing is to build those models. And the other thing is to actually try to align those models because uh, unlike language models, uh, vision language models sometimes are particularly interesting in terms of misbehaving. And when they say something that would be okay as a text, it might not be okay in combination with image, like the poor old lady crossing the road and other examples. Yeah, so you need to do something with those guys. There are many things you can do. Uh, and whatever was mentioned in the previous talk, uh, basically you can do human feedback or artificial feedback and then you can incorporate it in various ways with reinforcement learning or without that. Don't have time to talk about that. There is also time series foundation models, which is very interesting and has applications for like um, AI for science, whether it's brain imaging data 
or it is uh, weather data, or it's astrophysics data, and so on and so forth. There are multiple collaborations. But the main talk, and I have uh, less than three minutes left, was about should we actually try to do continual pre-training and why? So the usual way people train models in the field so far, whether it's a language or it's multimodal things like Gato, you just take multiple data sets, mix them together, and um, just train on essentially IED distribution. And many other examples, well, even Pile is uh, containing multiple different data sets, so on and so forth. But we all know that uh, basically we need more and more data to get uh, best models that chinchilla scaling laws uh, point and first in the directions of more data, smaller models. Llamas went even further in that direction, said, okay, forget about compute optimal, let's do inference optimal. Uh, but if you look at the llamas, they're still underfed. Even the smallest 7B llama is far from being saturated, so you need to give them more and more data. But, I mean, especially with limited compute, um, we cannot really, and this kind of limited time, we cannot just sit and wait for infinite amount of data to arrive. We should do something in the meantime and hopefully then continue training our models. Or we would like to build on top of other people's models also continually. We don't want to start from scratch. So uh, what do we do and what are the problems? When you train continually, it's harder to get to the model of the same quality uh, compared to when you train jointly IID, that's a well-known thing, because you may have difficulties adapting to new things when you learn something, you may have difficulties forgetting what you learned, and also, even if you manage to maintain stability plasticity, uh, as it's called in continual learning, you need to make sure that the model you learn sequentially is not worse than what would have happened if you learned that model jointly. So in any case, we have this um, uh, extended version of our last year a workshop paper now kind of submitted to a journal with all the details about how to do that. And essentially we uh, explore the usual schedules like the uh, usual cosine schedule uh, for learning grade and basically figure out how to best uh, adjust its parameters like the maximum learning rate and so on. We have several settings, uh, small models 410 million, large model 10 billion and another two settings uh, the distribution shift is relatively uh, benign from pile to slim pajama and more serious from pile to German language. And then essentially this is the final result, which, well, kind of as expected, trivially, of course, you save a lot of compute uh, if you don't train on the mix of the data, the dark blue is uh, kind of how much compute you need to train on the mix of the data, while uh, two versions of light blue, one is just uh, tuning learning rate schedule and other doing that plus replay. Uh, replay seem to be, let combinations seem to be best. Of course, they take less compute uh, because you only uh, train on the second uh, on the second data set. So the good thing is you save compute without actually compromising your performance, whether you measure the average validation loss, well, test loss, or if you take the average or multiple benchmarks. <clears throat> there was a question yesterday, what about MMLU? Unfortunately, on MMLU, uh, it does underperform compared to the union model, but on average across multiple benchmarks, it's pretty much as good as, and actually on slightly better on smaller models than the union model. So that's an interesting thing. I, I have no time to go into details. You can read the paper. And another interesting observation that historically came after all this learning rate exploration, infinite learning rate, maybe way to go. Basically, uh, you can, uh, anyway, so without going into details, it's cosine or inverse square root, but then you go flat. At any point, you can just exponentially uh, kind of decay and you get a uh, converged checkpoint whenever you want to. The good thing is new data come, you don't have to do anything, just keep going. And that turned out to be actually very convenient. So I basically encourage people in open source community to maybe save their time and compute and other people time and compute and try to do more of continual learning. I think that's a way to combine and build upon each other's work. Thank you.